However, he had not stopped trying to contain communism and keep it from spreading. One of Reagan's cornerstone beliefs was that he had to be a stone wall against communism. He hated communism. And he believed in containment, using whatever means necessary. And so when Cuba sent troops into the little island of Grenada in the Caribbean, Ronald Reagan sent in the Marines to stop Cuba from taking over this island nation. It wasn't much of a war, but it's a demonstration of Reagan's absolute stand against any spread of communism. But it's also that belief in stopping the spread of communism that causes the greatest scandal of his administration. The beginning of the Iran-Contra scandal was in Nicaragua. Nicaragua had elected a socialist as president of the country. Ronald Reagan saw that as the spread of communism. And so when a rebellion broke out against the leader of, of well, Nicaragua, a group called the Contras, because they were contra to the socialist leadership, Reagan began to look for ways to support their rebellion. The problem was, that after the uh, U.S. hostage situation, Congress had passed the Bolin Amendment that made it illegal to sell weapons to a revolutionary group. We could still sell weapons to a proper government, but not to a group that was looking to overthrow a proper government. And therefore, it was illegal for the Reagan administration to help the Contras. Reagan probably did not order or involve himself in what happened next. But members of his administration, including security advisor Oliver North, and National Security Advisor John Poindexter looked for ways to get around this ban on selling weapons to the Contras in Nicaragua. And they decided they would basically launder money. They would sell arms to the government of Iran, which was engaged in a war against Iraq. They would take the proceeds from that, from those sales, and not return them to the federal government who had paid for the, good, for the arms in the first place, but rather funnel off money to pay for arms to go to the Contras in Nicaragua. They were basically laundering the money, and they got caught. Oliver North shredded the documents that proved that they had done what they had done. <clears throat> Several low-ranking officials, including Oliver North, were convicted of committing crimes in Iran-Contra. These people convicted were later pardoned by President Bush I. Oliver North testified to Congress that Reagan knew all about this. 
but Reagan said he didn't know anything about it. A congressional investigation was very critical of Reagan because of his sloppy supervision of his subordinates, but they did not find that Reagan had been directly involved in breaking the law. And besides, the American people liked Ronald Reagan. The only remedy if he had broken the law was impeachment, and both Democrats and Republicans knew that that would never happen. And so basically, Ronald Reagan skates on this scandal and earns himself a new nickname. Not only is he the great communicator, he also becomes known as the Teflon president because nothing sticks to him. Reagan carried his strong anti-communist rhetoric to Berlin. We called on the Soviet premier to tear down the Berlin Wall, the very symbol of the Cold War. He said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It didn't happen immediately, but a few years later, after Ronald Reagan had left the presidency, it did happen. Despite his strong anti-communism, Ronald Reagan held summit meetings with the Prime Minister of the Soviet Union and got several treaties to reduce nuclear weapons. He believed that nuclear weapons should never be used and he wanted to remove nuclear weapons from the earth. But he also had an idea that if the United States could build a, an umbrella over itself, an umbrella that would stop missile attacks, would keep the United States from ever getting hit by a nuclear weapon should it be fired from the Soviet Union, that then we would have a position of power where we could start drawing down our nuclear arsenal as an example to the Russians. And so he proposed the Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars. Then virtually no one in the United States believed that this thing was possible. However, Reagan got billions of dollars passed through Congress to start working on it. And so while most Americans were skeptical that Star Wars would ever work, the Soviet Union believed it. They believed that the United States was in the process of building a shield above itself so that the Soviet Union could not attack us using long-range ballistic missiles. And they began to push Reagan to stop Star Wars in exchange for nuclear reduction. Reagan refused. And so Star Wars became the uh, symbol of America thwarting nuclear holocaust. But Star Wars pushed the Soviet Union into a hard decision. Their economy that had supported the arms race to this point was not strong enough to also fight an arms race in space as Star Wars was suggesting. And so the leadership of the Soviet Union had to make a decision. Were they going to provide guns or butter, as the expression went? Were they going to provide what their citizens needed? Food, shelter, 
clothing, that sort of thing? Or were they going to deprive their citizens of those necessities so that they could afford to combat Star Wars? Soviet Union decided their economy could not stand the additional expense <clears throat> to combat Star Wars. <clears throat> And so they began to pull back from the arms race so that they could afford to feed and house and clothe the citizens of the Soviet Union. Another of the great expenses that was hurting the Soviet economy and causing it to uh, deprive its citizens of necessities was their surprise for these puppet governments that they had set up after World War II in Eastern European countries. They had been basically paying the governments of Poland, of East Germany, of Czechoslovakia, and so forth. And that was getting expensive. So Premier Gorbachev of the Soviet Union began to negotiate freeing these Soviet satellite countries to cut the expenses of having to support them. And one of the negotiations that he went through was with Kohl, the Chancellor of Germany, and they reached an agreement where the Soviet Union would pull out of East Germany and let Germany once again reunify. This was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. Now, Ronald Reagan had played a part in bringing about this beginning of the decline of the Soviet Union. But he had played a part along with all of the presidents since Harry Truman, who had put containment policies into place to stop the spread of communism. So the Reagan administration was successful in its negotiations with the Soviet Union and was successful in bringing about the turn of American politics in a more conservative direction. In other words, from the perspective of today, Ronald Reagan made conservatism cool. In the early 1960s, if you said you were conservative, people looked at you like you were crazy. Now it was cool to be a conservative. <clears throat> because of his use of symbolism, bumper sticker slogans, that sort of thing. Appearance began to become more important than the facts when it came to politics. The optics became more important than what was really happening. That was not all Reagan's doing, but he starts the trend. He also starts the trend towards ideological purity, that we see more and more causing the two different parties to have less and less middle ground, less and less area for compromise. Litmus tests, for example. You can't be a good Republican if you believe, if you don't, if you're not anti-abortion. You can't believe, be a good Republican if you're not pro-gun, and so forth. Uncompromising. And this has helped lead to the polarization of American politics that we see today, where neither side is willing to compromise He brought about 
the restoration of American greatness in the eyes of the rest of the world. We became once again well-respected superpower in the world. But it was a changing world. And so his definition of American greatness tended to be in terms of what we had been and not what we were going to be in the new world. He introduced the concept that politics is not public service. Politics is a war for power. And that anything is acceptable in a war. And therefore, anything is acceptable as politicians pursue power. So the whole concept of the public, the politician being in Washington for the good of the people begins to decline during the Reagan years. Again, he's not responsible for the extremism that we have today, but it, the ten, tendency starts during his administration. <clears throat> and finally, what has become a cornerstone of the conservative movement, the belief that government is not a good thing, that government causes more problems than it solves. Or as Ronald Reagan famously said, Government is the problem. Government is not the solution. So these trends that so impact us today, we can trace back to beginnings in the Reagan administration. So let's cr let Crash Course talk about how the presidency of Ronald Reagan began to change the world of politics toward what we are experiencing today. George H.W. Bush had been Reagan's vice president and he became president. George Bush was a World War II fighter pilot, a hero, a graduate of Yale, an athlete. And yet he had in the public mind sort of a preppy caricature. He was not preppy, but because of his Ivy League background and his family's wealth, he became kind of a preppy image. He had come to Texas started his own successful oil business before he got into politics. He was a very experienced public servant. He'd been a congressman, an ambassador to the UN and to China, and director of the CIA before he became vice president under Ronald Reagan. So his ascendancy to the presidency was no surprise. But George H.W. Bush, I will call him Bush One, and I will refer to him as Bush One on tests and everywhere else. Bush One is George H.W. Bush, the father. And he comes to the presidency without the burning conservative convictions of a Ronald Reagan, and yet he is a conservative. Bush won is president when the Soviet Union releases its control over East Germany and Germany is reunited and masses of people storm the Berlin Wall and begin to knock it down. This is the symbol of the end of the Cold War. It is an important event in signaling to the world that this nuclear brinksmanship 
as has existed since the late 1940s is coming to an end. Now, it just happened that this fall of the Berlin Wall was while Bush won was president. But it's still a very important turning point in the 20th century. It's also important that Bush was an experienced enough at national, uh, international politics, at diplomacy, that he did not gloat. He did not say, we won the war, we won the war. He just let it happen. And that allowed the Soviet Union to save face, which was very important in upcoming negotiations with them. Because remember, even if the Berlin Wall comes down and the Cold War is over, both sides have thousands of nuclear weapons and delivery systems. Those have to be taken care of. Bush one runs into financial and economic problems of his own, partially as a result of the huge national debt that Ronald Reagan had run up, fighting communism, Star Wars, those kinds of things, and his tax cuts. One of the worst parts of the economic downturn under Bush was the savings and loans crisis. Savings and loans were institutes, institutions that financed consumer purchases, car loans, uh, furniture loans, stuff like that. And with the deregulation that had taken place under Reagan, they began to make increasingly risky loans because they could charge higher interest rates. And if those loans were paid off at the higher interest rates, the savings and loans made more money. But with the economic downturn, people couldn't pay back their loans. And so the savings and loans were threatened with going out of business. Bush one decided to bail out the savings and loan industry. And so the federal government paid $124 billion to the owners of these savings and loans to keep them from going bankrupt. The most significant event of Bush one's presidency was the Iraq war. Saddam Hussein in Iraq had run up huge deficits in fighting a war against Iran. They are both Muslim countries, but one is Shia and one is Sunni. And those two branches of Islam have been at literal war with each other for centuries. Because of the war debt, Saddam Hussein needed more money. So he decided to send his army into neighboring Kuwait to take over the oil fields in Kuwait so that he'd have more money, more oil to sell on the world market. Bush one made it clear that the United States would not tolerate this invasion of a foreign country. It had always been part of the American foreign policy to protect the oil resources of the Middle East. And so you could say this was a war about oil. Bush one put it in terms of protecting a sovereign nation from invasion by its neighbor. But he didn't just go in and uh, start fighting immediately. He took the time to use his diplomatic skills to put together a coalition of nations that opposed the Iraq invasion. These nations include not just Western nations, but also Arab nations like Lebanon and Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Once he had this coalition into place, then he 
had the Americans lead a coalition force to drive Saddam Hussein's army out of Kuwait. But then Bush one stopped and said, mission accomplished. The goal had been to remove Saddam Hussein's control from Kuwait. That had been accomplished and Bush one knew he could march to Baghdad, overthrow Saddam Hussein, one of the worst dictators in the world. We had the power, but he also knew enough about world politics to know that if we did that, then it would unleash a tribal war between the Sunnis and the Shias in Iraq and Iran, and could lead to world to a war throughout the Middle East. It would destabilize the situation in the Middle East. So he decided, nope, I'm not going to overthrow Saddam Hussein. I'm going to let him stay in power so I can keep stability in the all important Middle Eastern oil fields. And so he stopped and declared mission accomplished. Another area where Bush broke with Ronald Reagan was on taxation. He saw the growing federal deficit with alarm, and he decided that he needed to raise taxes. And so he got Congress to raise taxes to try to pay off some of the national debt. This did not endear him to many of the conservatives. And therefore, when he ran for president again for re-election, he had only a marginal acceptance among conservative Republicans because he had raised taxes. He probably did the right thing, but it cost him politically. Once again, I will use Crash Course to provide you with an overview of the administration of Bush one.